You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to another live edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition, I'm going to be bringing you my tactical analysis from an Arsenal perspective, of course, of the nil-nil draw at Brighton. Not the result that we wanted, not the result that we hoped for, but I think all things considered, it's a decent result. It's a decent point. And I've been thinking about the question basically all night, whether it was a point gained or two points dropped. And I think when you look at the way Arsenal performed, the fact that so many big players were just not at it, the fact that Brighton were so very good, I think you have to say that it probably uh, is a point gained. I think Mikel Arteta uh, kind of shared that viewpoint. I, I, I guess that's what I got from him in his post-match interviews and post-match press conference as well. Uh, so in this podcast, as I say, we're going to be looking into some of the tactical elements of the game and some of the reasons why I felt Arsenal couldn't get a grip on the game, couldn't really uh, get things under control. I want to say a big hello to everybody in the live chat right now. I hope you're all well. Just a few hellos to Pranjal, to John, to Wandering Minstrel, to Bungle, to Junior Gunner, to Omar. Hope you are all well. Um, yeah, uh, looking forward to getting stuck into this one. As I always say, though, on these tactical analysis shows, and I'm not trying to discourage you from listening via the audio platforms because that audience is just as, if not more important. No, not more important. That's that's wrong. But it's the original audience of the Chronicles of Aguna. So for those of you who have joined the channel recently or have joined the podcast recently, you won't know that the Chronicles of Aguna was not a YouTube channel. Um, it was just an audio podcast. And a lot of you started tuning in from there. But as the years have gone by, the the YouTube channel has grown and the YouTube channel allows me to present visuals in, which help with my analysis. So that's why I always say, especially on these tactical analysis shows, if you prefer to have the visuals in front of you, then please do come over to the YouTube channel, subscribe, give it a like, you know the draw by now. But as always, I will do my best to explain the points I'm making as clearly and as concisely as I possibly can for the audio listeners. So let's get into it. And I talked last night on the post-match reaction show, actually, about a couple of aspects, uh, a couple of areas in which I feel Arsenal maybe fell a little bit short yesterday. I thought that Takahiro Tomiyasu struggled. It was probably the game in which he struggled the most since joining the club. In fact, he's been brilliant in all the other games. Uh, but last night, I just thought there were certain elements of Tomiyasu's game that he struggled with. And I think, as I said on the post-match reaction show last night, a lot of that was tactical. So we're going to be getting into that today. We're also going to be talking about the midfield, which I think was the key yesterday. And it's the area in which Mikel Arteta had the, the most thinking to do. You know, Granit Xhaka, a player that divides opinion amongst the Arsenal fan base, but he's undoubtedly, as I always say, a very, very important member of this squad. He was missing and he is going to be missing until the new year. The biggest challenge, in my opinion, that Mikel Arteta has right now is to find the most effective way of dealing with that, of coping with his absence, because it is a, um, you know, it is a blow. And, and some of you would disagree. And, and some of you were asking me yesterday um, on, some of you were asking me on the post-match reaction show, what do I feel um, he would have brought to the table that maybe Sambi Lakonga didn't? And again, I'm going to go into that on this episode. Um, so, yeah, uh, get your questions in as well throughout and I'll make sure that I pick up as many of those as I possibly can. Um, right. Without further ado, let's get into it. So here we go. Let's kick off uh, with uh, bringing up. Uh, the tactics board. And this will help me to explain some of the points I'm going to be making. So you look at the way Arsenal lined up and we've got a pretty settled defence now in the Premier League. Takahiro Tomiyasu at right back, Ben White and Gabriel with a centre-back pairing with Kieran Tierney operating from the left. Moving into the midfield, Mikel Arteta opted to go with Albert Sambi Lokonga 
uh, alongside Thomas Partey. Odegaard played in the 10 role. Saka operated from the right. Emil Smith Rowe started from the left hand side, and Abamyang was playing through the middle. Now, I say Emil Smith Rowe started from the left hand side because he drifted an awful lot. He was always in this position, in fact. And as was Saka quite often, it was a good starting position for both of those guys. They were trying to get close to Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. When you look at the way the Spurs game went, one of the things that was better about Arsenal, I felt, and one of the reasons that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang looked a lot better, is that people were getting closer to him than they normally do. Now, we know when Lacazette plays, the, the wingers naturally gravitate in towards him. He is so good at the hold-up place. He is so good at that side of things. He is so good at laying the ball off first time to those in and around him. And I think what we've seen is um, a little bit of an adaptation in Arsenal's attack uh, in terms of the way we approach it and in terms of the frequency with which we try and get those players close to Aubameyang. Unfortunately, yesterday, Aubameyang's touch, Aubameyang's control, Aubameyang's first-time passes, they just, you know, he just wasn't at the races. It just wasn't a good game for Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. And look, top elite level footballers, they don't have those games too often, you know, and and you look at Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and there's no denying that over the 12, last 12 months, 18 months, he's had too many of those. And that is a worry. It is a concern. But I didn't think that was where the game uh, or, or where Arsenal lost control of the game yesterday. So what I want to do is I just want to share some uh, screenshots with you guys. Uh, first of all, with regards to um, to the team's overall shape. And then we'll talk a little bit about Tommy Asu. But let's begin with, with the Lokonga part, OK? Because what I found really difficult to kind of understand yesterday was exactly what role it was that Albert Lokonga uh, was supposed to be taking up. Now, when you look at Brighton's setup, I was probably a little bit naive in the build-up to this game. And I have to hold my hands up to this in thinking that their version of playing with a back three and the two wing-backs was quite similar to that of Chelsea's, but it isn't. Rather than playing with that uh, double man kind of support system to the centre forward, Brighton actually played with Mopai and Trossard almost like a front two. And then they packed out the midfield with Moda, Lalana, and Gross. Now, I said in the lead up to the game that I thought if they did play that two man attack in behind Neil Mopai, and I thought that would probably be Trossard and Lalana, that they would be a little bit vulnerable in the middle of the park because they'd have one less body in there. And I felt that Partey and Laconga, a double pivot would be perfect to deal with that. But I hold my hands up. I got that horribly wrong because Brighton didn't play that way. Brighton played with a flat three-man centre midfield. Um, and those players were taking it in turns to get forward and get up in support of Neil Mopai and Trossard, who would quite often pull wide. You often saw Mopai drifting into this slightly... Uh, left of centre position and Trossard doing the same on the right, which then opened the space for somebody like Lelana or Moda or Gross to just get into that space in front and occupy both Partey and Lokonga while still having that spare man. So I got that wrong uh, with regards to Brighton. And I think that that was one of the big issues. I don't think, well, I'm not saying that Arsenal didn't realise it because I'm sure their research would have been a lot more extensive and a lot more thorough and professional than mine. But I just felt like that midfield area was was the biggest problem for us. And I'm going to explain a little bit about why. Now, if you look at Arsenal's average position map from yesterday, this is the average positions of everybody in an Arsenal shirt throughout the 90 minutes. I talked about Saka and Smith Rowe coming in field. You can see that very clearly. They're getting close to Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. You could also see Martin Odegaard trying to make that kind of run on the outside of Saka when he drifted in. That's visible in their, um, you know, in their average positions. On the left-hand side, you can see Kieran Tierney pushing really high up the pitch, wide, as he always does. Partey trying to hold the centre of the midfield alone. Tommy Asu just slightly more reserved than Kieran Tierney. White and Gabriel, where you'd expect the two centre-halves. But the key here for me is the positioning of Albert Sambi Laconga. Now, we all know that Arsenal's system is very much geared to creating the space and creating the assurance that then allows Kieran Tierney to get forward. It's key. It's something that we've done time and time again under Mikel Arteta, and we will continue to do, I'm sure. But this is where I felt Arsenal went slightly wrong yesterday, and this is where Arsenal probably needed to adapt their game slightly. So you look at that and you can see that Sambi Lakonga is to the left of centre, 
and quite deep. Now, if you compare this to the average position map that we had against Spurs, so Lokonga on this map is number 23. Now, compare that to the one against Spurs. Look at Granit Xhaka's position, the number 34 on this touch map. He is much narrower than Albert Lokonga is. He is much closer to Thomas Partey than Albert Lokonga is, which gives us that stability in the middle of the park. It means we can swallow up all of the pitch in that area. It means that there's not more than 10, 15 yards ever between those two players. And that makes it very, very difficult for people to breach that midfield. It almost forces them wide, which is what you want, right? You want to defend the width of your penalty area. First and foremost, you want to send people into the wide positions. Now, I know the game was very different. And I know that Brighton play a different system. The, the addition of the wing backs means that Brighton will go wider than Tottenham were ever going to go. And so there's a natural inclination for somebody like Lekonga to drift out slightly wider of, of the centre. Now, not only is he drifting out, in my opinion, because he is um, worried and concerned about leaving Kieran Tierney to deal with the onrushing wing back, especially in the cases when Kieran Tierney's bombed forward. But I think the fact that he is a right-footed player playing on the left-hand side has also played a part here. Now, why, you might ask? Well, I think as a right-footed player playing on the left, in your mind, and I, I talked about this yesterday on the post-match reaction, but I'll demonstrate it a little bit more in detail now. And, and I'm just highlighting Albert Lekonga here on the tactics board. Now, if you want to receive the ball as a central midfield player who's playing on his wrong side, Naturally, you're going to step five, seven yards more to the left wider because you'd rather have more space inside of you. OK, you'd rather receive the ball and be able to turn into this space than be able to turn into this space on the outside of you. Why? Because it's your natural you know, you, you prefer to go where your natural foot is. You prefer to go for comfort. And Albert Lekonga, for me, just dropped that five or pulled that five to seven yards wider as a result of playing on his wrong side. So that when he did receive the ball, he had a bigger space to then deal with um, or to then step into in field rather than looking to go on the outside. If he receives the ball something more like here, which is something more like the position that Granit Xhaka takes up, then you're quite likely to need to go on the outside to escape the press. Granit Xhaka can do that because Granit Xhaka is left-footed. I'm not saying that Granit Xhaka is miles better than Sambi Lakonga. I'm not saying anything like that. All I'm saying is that a naturally right-footed player will always seek to cut inside onto his right foot where possible. And as you kind of get to grips with that position and you, you suss out and you get a feel of the game, your natural inclination will be to pull that little bit wider. So I think Lekonga's positioning, which I've just highlighted, or average positioning, which I've just highlighted as being a little bit too wide, in my opinion, is a result of two things. First of all, the fear of Brighton coming down the flank with their fullbacks and the pace that they possess, but also the fear of having to turn on the outside more often and being on your weaker foot, from which he's less likely to play those defence splitting passes that he's become renowned for, from which he's less likely to want to take somebody on and carry the ball forward. So I think that played a part for Albert Sambi Lakonga. So the fact that Lakonga was pulling that little bit wider, I think, meant that there was too much of a distance between himself and Thomas Partey. I really, really do. And Thomas Partey struggled as a result of that, not just because he had a bigger distance to cover than he did against Tottenham Hotspur, but because he had to deal with Brighton's very, what's the word, proactive, very uh, attack-minded midfield. And if I show you Brighton's average positions here, and you look at this now, you can see that Mopai was, you know, drifting in behind Trossard, who was coming in centrally. So those two were occupying the centre-backs. You can see that the number 15, the 13 um, are both quite narrow, that Lalana was picking the ball up in deeper positions, but that Brighton's back line were pushing right up to the halfway line. And all of a sudden, they create this flood of players, don't they, in the centre of the pitch which then means that Thomas Partey could really do with having his central midfield partner tucked in nice and compact alongside him. And I didn't feel that Arsenal did that well enough, if I'm honest. So that was the, the issue in midfield for me. And again, I'm not sitting here, you know, pointing at Albert Lekonga and saying he's the reason we didn't win the game. I talked about it yesterday. Too many 
of our big players were under par. Their touch wasn't right. Their the energy levels had dropped so significantly from just a week ago. And when you consider we hadn't played in midweek, that is quite disappointing. So there, there was a combination of reasons as to why we didn't win the match. But I thought I'd highlight that midfield imbalance because you guys asked me yesterday, those of you that tuned in on the live reaction show, what I thought Granite Xhaka would have brought to the side that would have made a difference. And my answer is simply that I think he would have been a little bit more tucked in and a little bit closer to Thomas Partey, uh, meaning that Arsenal may well have given up more possession in the wide areas, but would have been a lot more compact in the centre, which is ultimately where teams are looking to hurt you from. So that's... um, that's my uh, that's my opinion on why Arsenal's midfield was just lacking that little bit of balance. Um, Tim Jallo says, uh, if you look at Lukonga scouting videos, you'll see him ping accurate long balls with both feet. Yeah, but when you're looking at the scouting videos, Tim, th- those videos are put together of a player's best bits, right? That's what they are. They're the player's best bits. So you, you're you not going to see the moments where he does look that little bit less comfortable on his, on his weaker foot. And this is not even a direct criticism of Lukonga. You know, there are so many players or every player. I mean, it's just a handful that I can remember throughout my lifetime that were truly two-footed. So it's not a dig at Lukonga. It's not to say he's not a good footballer or that he won't really go on and develop to be a very, very good player. It's just a natural inclination, I believe, that a right foot player would have when operating from a slightly left position. And I think he struggled with it. And I think it impacted his starting position, which therefore impacted the balance in our midfield. And it's why I put in the title the midfield imbalance. So I really did think um, that that was an issue. Uh, Moving forward, I I wanted to talk a little bit about the right back situation as well, because I felt like um, Tommy Asu really, really uh, struggled to deal with Kukurea, who was coming down that left-hand side, um, of course, for Brighton and Hove Albion. And he was doing that with great frequency. You know, I think he was one of the better players on the pitch. Uh, He was that good. And Look, I'd heard a lot about Mark Cucurella uh, prior to him coming to the Premier League and, and I'd seen flashes of what he could do this season in a Brighton shirt, but never did I envisage him causing us this many problems. And, you know, there's a part of me that thinks, yes, he was good. He was fantastic. He did everything he was asked. But there's also a massive part of me that thinks he wasn't so much better than Takahiro Tomiyasu. But the fact is that the way we set up in comparison to them meant that Tommy Asu was being pulled into areas that he simply doesn't want to be in. Now, for me, you know, there are different types of fullbacks, okay? There are, you know, your traditional fullbacks who want to pull right out to those wide areas, who want to get forward with width, make overlapping runs on the outside. That, for me, is not Takahiro Tommy Asu's game. Now, while we have seen that, of course, he can do that, that he can get forward, that he can support people further up the pitch, The strength of Takahiro Tomiyasu, in my opinion, as a fullback, is that he is essentially a bit of a centre-back, right? He is a centre-back in that he's played there for large periods of his career and that he his ideal position is on the right side of a back three. So what does that do? That means that if that's your preferred position, then just like Lakonga would have that inclination to pull slightly left of centre, I think for Tomiyasu, the inclination is to tuck in as close to his central defender as he possibly can. You defend as a unit, you defend compact, and that provides strength in 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 the unit, not in the individual. And teams will often look to isolate individuals because that's how they feel they will get the beating of people. That's how they'll uh, cause people problems. And I just felt that given the width that Kukurea brought to the side, Tomiyasu was constantly having to go out and confront him in really wide positions and being exposed. As I keep saying, Takahiro Tomiyasu doesn't want to go out there. He doesn't want to go and confront someone on the touchline. Takahiro Tomiyasu wants to be as close to Ben White as possible, provide some stability that way, be part of the central defensive unit, essentially. And I just felt um, that, you know, the way Kukurea played, the way that Brighton set up meant that Tomiyasu was constantly being pulled out into positions in which he couldn't really get comfortable. Also, add to that the fact that Takahiro Tomiyasu has not yet been pressed to that level. Yeah, you know, he's faced a press in the Premier League, but Brighton were not pushing, you know, a left midfielder onto Takahiro Tomiyasu, who will want to press, but also won't want to be pulled out that wide because wants to remain compact and wants to remain as close to his teammates as possible. But in Brighton's case, Kukurea's job and Veltman's job 
was to bring width to the table. And so they have got no reservations about going as far wide as possible. And that gives them space to receive the ball. And it puts the to- uh, Takahiro Tomiyasu sorry, in a position where at some point he has to go out and do what doesn't come naturally to him. And that is to pull out to a wide position and confront people. So those were two of the reasons, two of the big reasons I felt that Arsenal... Uh, for me, you know, just never really got a hold of this game. We're never in control of it at any point. I think when you look at Brighton, I think they set up perfectly. I think we were in in a bit of a difficult space leading into this game in terms of do you change your game for Brighton or do you say, no, we believe in what we're doing. We understand that there are different challenges that they pose to, for example, Tottenham. And we maybe need to make some slight tweaks and adaptations, which I felt we probably did fail to do. That is make those tweaks and adaptations. Or do you try and match them up? And I think that if you go into every single fixture trying to match people up, then you don't have an identity. You lose your own identity. And I said before the game that I felt like Mikel Arteta would now try and embed this philosophy and this identity because it's one of the big criticisms that's been thrown his way uh, since taking the role. So I think he is going to stick with it now. I think this is the go-to system. It is the go-to formation. I think you'll see variations between this and maybe that slightly um, different 4-1-4-1 or 4-3-3, whatever you want to call it. But I think this is the way that he wants to go. And I think we just probably need to get a little bit wiser and a little bit smarter in dealing with the challenges that playing against this system uh, brings to the table. So that's why I've called it midfield imbalance and Takahiro Tomiyasu struggles because I felt like they were two big parts of why Brighton were able to control the game uh, for the most part. Having said that, I said it already, you know, lots of players were below par. I thought uh, Partey wasn't his usual self, partly down to being kind of exposed in that position. Odegaard certainly wasn't his usual self. I thought Saka and Smith Rowe showed signs but without really um causing too many issues apologies there for the sneeze um so yeah and and of course pierre emerick Aubameyang, you know we all know that he certainly uh wasn't up to the level required yesterday so uh the football wasn't great the result wasn't great but it's a decent point and i think i'll, I'll reiterate the point I, again that i made late on last night's show you know 10 points out of a possible 12, that is title challenging form. I'm not saying that Arsenal are title challengers or anything like that. I'm just saying that remember that and apply a little bit of context when judging on how um, good or bad yesterday's result was. Because, you know, for me, you've got to strike that balance. You've got to find that understanding and you've got to, as a fan, temper your expectations so that you're not outraged at every given opportunity because there's really no need to be based on yesterday. You know, if you're frustrated because of things that have gone on in the recent months, then I understand that. But looking at yesterday's game in isolation, we weren't at the races. It's as simple as that. Best thing about last night is that we didn't lose. We didn't get beat. And we've got a point. And as I say, 10 from a possible 12 is a pretty good return. And a return, that, if we're being completely honest, you'd have all taken uh, at the start of the season, given the way we kicked off the campaign. So um, there's one more point I wanted to make uh, about Brighton's press, which I thought uh, was obviously very, very good. And you saw Brighton really kind of cause us all sorts of issues uh, with that. To my surprise a little bit, actually, Lalana was probably... Uh, the least aggressive and and the one who dropped that little bit deeper. But just highlighting now on the tactics board, uh, for those of you that can see it, that are watching on YouTube, how Brighton looked to really squeeze us into our own half. Something that I felt we did really well against Norwich. And I think we did really well in the first half against Tottenham. Um, Let me just show that to you guys. So Brighton really pushing us up. And and look, Aaron Ramsdale said it, didn't he? In his post-match interview, we needed to learn... um, you know, or we need to learn how to deal with that press, how to cope with it, how to beat it. And I didn't think we were good enough in beating it yesterday in terms of our passing. We weren't as brave in our passing. Maybe that's because of the conditions. Partly, maybe it's because Arsenal just didn't feel like they were at the races. Sometimes you get those feelings and, you know, you're in a match and you don't really, you know that you started with a bit of a struggle and you don't really have the confidence to try the things that would normally just be second nature. So I think that, our distribution from the back was a little bit safer uh, than it was against Spurs and then it was against Norwich. 
And that meant that we struggled to break the press because, you know, with with Brighton, more so than most, I mean, you look at that back line of Burn, Dunk and Duffy, right? And I know they're not household names and I know they're not necessarily superstars, but what they are all is incredibly powerful in the air. They're all huge, huge defenders. They can play a bit as well, to be fair to them. But, you know, in a game like this, ordinarily when it's not your day and you're not beating the press and you're struggling and your opponent is doing it so effectively, you would go long. You'd go that little bit more direct. You'd try and hit Saka or Oba and Emil Smith-Rowe. Um, you know, Oba showed against Spurs that when we did need to go long, he can compete in the air um, against their centre-halves anyway. He couldn't really... Um, compete with Dunk, Burn, Duffy. All three of those are absolute giants. And and so I felt that what Brighton brought was a very, very good press and then the ability to deal with those long balls as well or those more direct balls. So I think that's something that Graham Potter has got a really nice balance around, you know, the ability to, to cope with uh, long direct football, but also to be able to press and squeeze people uh, really high up the pitch and win the ball back in those positions. So, um, yeah, I guess that concludes my analysis, my tactical analysis um, of uh, of Brighton nil, Arsenal nil in the Premier League. Look, I think the international break is here now, and and you know we kind of got to use this opportunity to reflect and 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 you know kind of reset ourselves. I think the intensity that we and and the level that we hit against Spurs was always going to be difficult to mirror. Uh, again, um, you're not going to play the way you play in a derby every single week. And I think people need to process that and understand that. But equally, the, the lack of energy, the lack of pace, the lack of um, control was it was a concern. But you have off days. And when you look at, um, you know, when you look at how how poor or inconsistent Arsenal have been over the last 18 months or so to think that we were going to go just because we beat Spurs and now win every single game, especially away from home against a side in very, very good form with lots of great things going for them. A very, very well coached side, I think was was maybe us being a little bit entitled as a fan base. It's a good point for me and we move forward and we move on. Right, we are going to leave it there uh, because I'm struggling to uh, hold back the sneezes. I don't know what's happened to me this morning. I've woke up with a bit of a sniffle, uh, which is not great, but it is what it is. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're around about 200 subscribers away from hitting the 17,000 mark here on YouTube. If you're an audio listener, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That really, really does help. Let's just quickly check in where we are in terms of the likes right now. I can see uh, there's a fair few of you watching, but we've only got 22 likes on the board. Let's get that up to 50 uh, ASAP. So like, 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 hit the like button. Really, really appreciate it. I'll catch you all very, very soon with more Arsenal and football related content. Until then, take care and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Goodbye. listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.